Howdy. Howdy. Hey, glad you're here. Thanks, Shelly. Um, yeah, so what we like to do is just talk, right? It's, um, it's kind of weird because most people these days are doing this all the time, and you're just talking to your phone, you're looking at your phone or whatever, but we like just to sit and have a conversation. So, Mike, I appreciate you being here. Um, no worries. Mike, uh, Mike and I and David and Justin and a bunch of other people in this room, we've been on Zoom calls for a year. A year, at least. Yeah. Um, yeah, you'll see that one of us does not know how to speak English as we go through this. I'll let you decide which one um, as we go through it. Two here. cultures divided by a common language. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, so very happy to have you here. Thanks for being here, and thanks for the great introduction, Shelley. Um, so um, before we get into RS Group and Design Spark, and we're going to get into what they're doing here, why it's important to our community, why it's important to you guys that are here that chose to show up. We appreciate that very much. Um, but I always like to start with you because your title is basically head of really cool, fun, innovative, futuristic stuff. At yep, a, that, that's what I put on the business card. At a global company with thousands of employees, right? Billions of revenue. So a lot of college kids would go, how do I get that job? How did you, how did you get that job? How did I get Not by design is the um, short answer. So, uh, yeah, my background is nothing to do with your... Know, the stuff that I'm involved with today. Uh, I started off as a politics and economics student, um, yeah, majoring, majoring in on politics uh, and particularly environmental politics. And this was in the 1990s. So this was when, yeah, before sustainability, ESG and all those things were particularly popular. Um, I did think I was going to change the world. I, I, I genuinely believed that yeah, what I was doing was going to be meaningful and important. As it's turned out, it is meaningful and important. It's just not in the direction that I thought it was going to be. Um, so um, life took a twist. Uh, it was in the mid-90s in the UK. It, the UK was going through a bit of a depression at the time, a recession uh, on there. So you, you end up diversifying. And I found this, this strange place. I was up in Newcastle, which is in the far north of England. Right? So I was yeah, taking my studies seriously, realised I needed some cash. Um, so I was in, in a place where you know, my, my wife-to-be had come with me, um, believing that I was going to lead her to fortune and riches, quite disappointed at that point, um, yeah, particularly when I was saying, well, you're the main wage earner, so yeah, well, yeah, I just need to focus on my studies and take them seriously. Um, and then in, the, in that period, uh, a trade counter, as we called them at the time, popped up in Newcastle, yeah, by this company called RS Components. I'd never heard of them. Um, but so I went along, applied for a job, and my first memory of working for RS was in a freezing cold warehouse in the middle of winter in the UK, folding boxes that we were then going to put stock in for, uh, for that warehouse to open. So to go from where I was then, where basically it was an entry-level job, um, yeah, basically funding my degree in me being all serious and going to change the world to where I am now is yes something that I look back on and say to say to my occasion how did we get here because I don't understand it but it's been brilliant on a journey with a business that has yeah you you heard Shelley say earlier does so many different things and does so many cool things so I've been able to go through my life with that business you move from location to location yeah, did a bit of teaching as well, did a bit of um, lecturing in the university, realised that that wasn't for me, so moved back, it, it focused on the private sector, and that's how I've ended up kind of working through RS in different layers to different areas, working on Design Spark, working in innovation, and to where I am today. Fun. So tell us about RS Group. So what does, for people who don't know, by the way, it's rsgroup.com. Um, it's on my phone here, speaking of phones. So rsgroup.com is a new website. It was Electro Components, and now it's officially RS Group as of May something, right? May 1st, something like May, that. Yeah. Um, but it's got an incredible website. And for those of you who are investors, um, the investor presentation on this is really extensive and really good. And it'll tell you a whole lot about the company. Um, but if you look at this, there's 650,000 products, 1.2 million customers, 80 countries, and 60,000 parcels a day. So tell us what that is. So our business is all about serving industrial customers. So what do we mean by an industrial customer? We mean 
manufacturers, people who make things, people who maintain premises, but those that make things, people who contract in to those who make products uh, and make services. Um, and that means that we're focused on how do you serve what we call the B2B market in that, in that arena. Um, we offer a, ra- a whole range of products. So in the, yeah, when, when I started at, in RS, yeah, we were known for having this big catalog on the shelf or this big yeah, this group of catalogs. And that's how engineers and yeah, maintenance ma- managers knew us. We had this set of catalogs that meant you basically, they were, they were your directory. That was where you went to, to go and find products that you needed when you didn't know you need them. And that was our market. That has been our market over a, pe- a period of 80 plus years. That so we provide the things that you don't know you need when you don't know you need them. So it's what like, we call high volume, uh, sorry, high mix, low volume. Like to keep uh, production lines running, yep. assembly lines, So food, to keep, to keep design engineers, it, yeah, with just in time products to keep production line runnings, uh, running, to keep maintenance uh, teams supplied with just in time equipment. Uh, the things, the emergency need, the, the spare need, and the plan need. Right. And electronics as well. Right? It, it covers all of the, the, uh, the core technologies from electronics, electrical, automation, to- tools, health and safety, um, you know, dishwasher tablet, no, not dishwashers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So tell them uh, what RS originally uh, stood for. So Do you remember? Uh, I wasn't there. Okay. Um, so, RS means radio spares, so that's how we started off. Um, it was founded in 1937 by two gentlemen working out of a, um, uh, a garage unit in the south of London. Um, and it was founded on the basis of, you know, there were these new things called wirelesses that everybody was listening to. So how do you supply them with the spares, the transistors, the resistors that are gonna keep those, those wirelesses operational? I think Allied's got a similar origin story in terms of where it came from. Allied Radio, uh, as I think it was previously called, Ken's nodding in the background, which is good and reassuring. Um, but s- similar origin story of yeah, how, yeah, this new technology that was coming in, it needs servicing. So how do you keep those uh, parts supplied to people when they go wrong? Trans- your radios did go wrong in those days. So you, you have parts to fix them, right? Yeah. So you and, from there. Yeah, and for what, about 40 years, that was what people knew for you. You bought the RS bag. You bought the RS pack. Um, so you yeah, with resistors, semiconductors, your yeah, valves, your yeah, relays, etc. They are all packaged up and sold as RS. And then we acknowledge that actually we don't make them. We buy them in. So yeah, we we um, expose the fact that it comes from manufacturers. And those manufacturers, yeah, our, our role is we sit between the supplier, the people that make the product, and the customers that need them, and we join the dots together because yeah, they, we're servicing the market that is not profitable for them to fulfill because lots of small demand. But we can consolidate that and fill that gap. Right, so let's talk, um, before we get into innovation, let's talk uh, one of your brands, which is the name of our building now, is Design Spark. So tell us about what is Design Spark and how does it relate to RS Group? Uh, so I was uh, involved in the origins of Design Spark. One of the journeys that I went on uh, within the, our group was to challenge ourselves about how do we maintain relevancy to engineers. Yeah, as you move out of the catalog era and into di- uh, digital presence, how do we maintain relevance in the, uh, to engineers and provide them with tools and resources that are going to help them design faster and be more productive in their day job, take away their pain points. So Design Spark was originated from a group of us sitting together, working out the answers to those questions and then going out and talking to lots and lots of different engineers to say, have we got this right? Yeah, we got a proposition here around, yeah, you guys want to talk to each other. You don't want the sales guy in the middle. You want to be able to talk to peers. You want to be able to collaborate and communicate together and work, yeah, get access to software, to cab uh, information, to your life cycle information, the things that you need to make informed choices around the products that go on to your your design. And that's how we originated Design Spark. And yeah, we launched it back in uh, 2010. Um, it's now 1.2 million members uh, that we've got globally. So we, uh, our biggest membership is in Japan. Um, we are officially big in Japan. Uh, eight is a pop <laughs> reference. Um, uh, our second biggest membership is in the UK, and our third biggest membership is here in the US. 
um, and we we grow at around 120,000 members a year, um, and we provide them with all the things that you can see on the on the um, uh, pop up there. So yeah, everything around community, around technical tools, around resources, uh, around yeah competitions and insight uh, and uh, so on and so on. And we yeah that brand has become synonymous with design engineers at all levels and giving them entry level tools up to high end premium capabilities uh, that I look for. Something I, yeah, you can tell I'm massively proud to have been associated with it and I'm massively proud to be leading what we're doing now with Design Spark as well. And yeah, being able to put our name to something like this, we're working with you guys is just yeah, amazing. And yeah, I think it's the next evolution on our journey. Super. So online then i can go online and be in a community of peers right and and learn things but then i'm naturally going to turn to your products probably and your services because you've provided the platform right yep. so it's just a it's a it's another distribution yep. platform for your, your yep. brand it, right? it's a brand play to make yeah. it make us relevant to engineers it's how do you get relevance and stickiness with engineers yeah, when they are in the middle of a design process, that means they don't want to in, be in, interfered with by having to talk to a sales guy or take it, talk to product uh, or supplier representative, give them the information. Yeah, if you yeah. can provide information, information provides data back, which provides insight, which informs then the choices that we can make around how to best help them and serve them with product. Okay, so while you're doing that, there's 60,000 packages a day going out the door Right, so there's a huge distribution company, a solutions provider is what you guys are really turning into. So how does that relate to, I mean, why are we here, right? Why are you guys in Bryan, Texas with the Design Spark Innovation Center? Uh, you kind of talked about one of the reasons there, which is we are turning into a solutions-based company. So yeah, our journey has been over the course of the last five years from you being a provider of products into a provider of solutions to customers. So that means we've made some acquisitions. So we bought new businesses. Um, yeah, we now run an integrated supply business that Doug leads um, to be able to bring together yeah, the indirect procurement management that customers need and take away 80% of their problems, yeah, which, call, yeah, which yeah, they are unplanned and they don't need to manage. Yeah, through into the way that we you know, manage our technical support and help. So Jim, uh, who Jet Shelley called out earlier, Jim is managing the development of our technical solutions and services that yeah, integrate digital capability with real-time customer support. Um, so our business is evolving and what we want to be is at the front of the next wave. So why we came here was, yeah, first of all, this is a destination venue for us. This is the, we the relationship that we, with A&M, yeah, the <coughs> innovation that comes out from this environment, it's a destination venue. So we want to build a destination center to capture that that innovation and bring that innovation in and harvest it and bring new businesses out to market. The more new businesses that come to market, the better it is for us, just generally. Okay. Secondly, specifically, it's finding the opportunities that sit within there that give us competitive advantage for the future. So how do we build our moat around our business by increasing our access to new technology, to new services, new solutions, the things that we wouldn't imagine ourselves, but people coming into this center will imagine, and therefore the opportunity to be at the forefront of that and help them realize their, their vision, and at the same time have access into being able to give them uh, routes to market through our customers. Yeah, we've got 1.2 million customers worldwide, our suppliers, our two and a half thousand plus suppliers, uh, our channels, yeah, we have a great digital presence. I think we've got over 120 million visits per annum into our websites. Um, yeah, that's, that's a market access that I guess most startups would dream of being able to access. We can offer that to people and that's part of why we want to be here because we can help accelerate. Yeah. But really, why are you here? <laughs> Why am I here today? No, really, Be with I mean, you. You're the, the Aggie, the Aggie Network, right? That's one of the, the ways. Network, one of the ways it, it, we, huge, we landed here, right? Yeah. We landed here because A and M and Aggie Land is really, really important uh, to what we've seen come through. We've seen yeah, uh, a huge amount of talent that's come in uh, into our business from the Aggie Land. We've seen a huge amount of business opportunity progress yeah, mm -hmm. through what, uh, what we've been exposed to uh, through Aggie Land. So. Being able to be embedded as part of that is, yeah, 
there's an opportunity that comes out that we just wouldn't realize otherwise. This is great. I'm going to keep fishing. Actually, I'm just going to I'm just going to give you the answer. The a, there are CEOs in Aggie, right? Yeah. So, he also says we should be here, which is yeah, yeah, a different. Yeah. And so he said, do it here, obviously. But no, there, it's there's a great reasons. But but really, it's the power of the Aggie network. Lindsley Ruth is class of anybody who knows what class he is. Ninety one. He's ninety. Ninety one. Ninety ninety two. He's class of ninety two. Industrial distribution major. Um, fantastic relationships with the ID department here. Um, he was the 2017 Worldwide Electronics CEO of the Year, worldwide. He, did, he and his team, his company that he leads, just put this company back in the FTSE 100, which is the top 100 companies in the UK. They were just voted the number one company on the London Stock Exchange last year. Uh, featured in uh, all kinds of trade magazines, all kinds of publications. So this is a company that's, that's pretty well known in, oh, what you said, we're two, what, cultures divided by a common language, yeah. right? On the other side of the pond, right? They're pretty well known on the other side of the pond. Um, in Texas, the, um, the market presence has been Allied, and Allied has a, a very large presence, distribution presence in Fort Worth, um, 200 plus thousand square feet, is that? I was close. Five, I, was, I did it in meters. I was doing it in metric. So yeah, let's call it 580,000 square feet. I was trying to be kind to our guest here and do the conversion. Um, but almost 600,000 square feet in, in Fort Worth. And so a, a very robust distribution presence, a very robust customer presence, and, and a supplier presence uh, in Texas. So this is not an opportunity that is just overseas, just Japan, just Asia Pacific, whatever. It's global. Um, and it's based here. So you combine that with the Aggie Network, which, you know, we're the number one uh, public university in America as far as study abroad programs go, right? Put more kids into study abroad programs. Great um, presence worldwide through this Aggie Network. It's a pretty powerful combination. And then we combine that, we think, we combine that with this really kind of cool yeah. building that uh, our friends at, at Nutribolt left for us. Um, and, uh, and the things that Shelley's doing and others in the city of Bryan, we go, hey, what can we do with this? So it's been wonderful to work with their entire team and Mike especially on uh, on these efforts. So let's get a little more specific. Can you tell them the Raspberry Pi story? Is that even allowed to talk? Yeah, to yeah, it's, it's, okay. it's tell it's them because that's kind of the genesis for yeah. really what y'all are starting to do. I think. Yeah. Uh, it's, so who knows Raspberry Pi by the way? Just, just not assume familiarity. Good. So yeah, that's pretty much. Yeah, uni unanimous. Well, tell everybody else yeah. really quick. So Raspberry Pi is a single board computer. Um, what does that mean? That means it was designed basically to be a single platform for yeah, entry level use uh, for kids, for schools, for education use primarily was the re original concept behind Raspberry Pi. Um, and it comes with a whole coding language behind it, Python. Uh, it comes with a yeah, support infrastructure that come, is around there, based, uh, built by a lot of a group of people in Cambridge in the UK, yeah, a, a spin out from the university there. Um, we started blogging around this on uh, Design Spark back in 2010, 2011, because the origin story was starting to come to light there. And that caught the interest of uh, this, uh, the founder uh, of Raspberry Pi, Evan Upton. Uh, Evan came to talk to us. Um, uh, long story short, he said, You guys should sell our product. We said, Yeah, we think we should as well. Um, and we then launched Pi in 2012, uh, I remember, no, it was 2013, I remember being at a conference in Nuremberg uh, and being told we have 48 hours to get this thing live onto our website with no stock, with no information uh, around it and yeah, we, we made that happen. Yeah, and yeah, we're, we are, what, 120 million devices sold later, um, yeah, worldwide, it, it's now one of our biggest product lines. Uh, it's now, yeah, it's ubiquitous in, in this space. It's become a platform for all kinds of development. Uh, it's in, in Teslas, it's in uh, devices worldwide, uh, globally. So the, the Pi story is one that yeah, of both opportunity, because we've, we've gained you know, massively from being able to take Pi out to market uh, that we've gained, uh, but also opportunity lost, because yeah, we wanted to be part of that story. And if we'd, we'd have been doing what we're doing now we would be thinking about investing in this as well so yeah it's a brand that has taken out the yeah, they are now yeah, spinning out and floating um their trading arm so yeah it's it's the one that lindsley uses to say i want to find the next pie 
and I want to be in at the beginning of this and that in means I'm investing as well. Yeah. Did they even take you to dinner or anything? Or <laughs> uh, we had some dinners. Some yes. dinners. Okay. You got a dinner out of, and you got yeah. you know a bunch of products sold too. Yeah. But but I think you know that's the, the origin story that we've heard as well, which is okay, as a company that used to be a quote unquote stodgy distribution company, and you guys know what I'm talking about. The distribution companies with the catalogs, right? And you just flip the catalog and you call the guy up and it's a transaction, it's a purely transaction. Do you have what I need? Yes, I do. Ship it to me. Thank you very much. Done. The next transition of this company is solution provider. It's an investor and it's getting innovative products into the hands of their customers and then telling the manufacturers, if I'm saying this right, hey, you should be making this. You guys need to be making this because I can sell it over here. Am I yeah. saying this? Yeah, to totally. I, the, yeah. Part of what Pi brought to us was the ability to go and talk to our supply chain and our manufacturers and say, you need to be on this board. You need yeah. to be part of this product design because there is huge opportunity that's going to come that you're going to miss out on if not. So, yeah, again, part of the value that we, we brought in, not just to Pi, but to other uh, brands as well, is being able to create their supply chain for them being able to create the uh, the users uh, and the manufacturers that they work with. Yes, and, and Debbie was here, what, two weeks ago? Somebody remember calendar dates? Uh, Debbie yeah, Lentz, who's the, yeah. was it last week? Yeah. Uh, global head of supply chain for RS Group was here um, just last week. Right, right. So now, this, now new head of ESG Solutions. And ESG Solutions, there you go. Um, so um, definitely getting attention, right? This is the global head of innovation, uh, excuse me, the North American head of uh, of innovation, right? North American headquarters for innovation for your company yep. is is this yep. building right here. They're present. So, multiple things you're going to be doing here. You want to kind of tick off like working with the university or investing in companies or how, walk us through what are you going to be so, doing? Yeah, here? So, so the plays that we're de we're going to be developing here are yeah, around how do we help small businesses accelerate and go faster. So that's going to take the form of yeah, how do we work with people like Shelley on the programs that. Uh, we'll bring talent into the um, uh, incubator. Yeah, how do we then accelerate those through yeah, support that we can provide, mentorship programs, yeah, access to customers, suppliers, to be able to help uh, them develop and test product uh, ideas, help, able to help design and iterate. Uh, and we're also gonna look at building some design lab capability as well. So how do we help people actually prototype uh, and build out their, their products so that they're market ready? Uh, yeah. to be able to move on to the next phase. So that means we're going to put capability into the building that isn't here at the moment. It also means that we're going to put people into the building that means that they're going to be on site supporting uh, the, the users of the centre as they come through as well. Um, so David, uh, David Ross up there is going to be leading a lot of that work, um, but it won't be David alone because uh, there's only one of him. Um, and there's a lot of users that we're hoping to get coming through the center as well. Um, we will be investing in talent, in people, um, as well as in, in businesses uh, to be able to help accelerate those as we move forward. Yeah. And what is there a particular business or category or industry that you're looking at? Or are you still defining? Um, we're still doing the work to actually def define some of those areas. I, yeah, we, we're very strong in terms of industrial manufacturing. So industry four and industry five, as Jim talks about now, yeah, our key themes in terms of where, where do we want to play. But yeah, if you kind of look at the key trends that are happening around us now, digitization of manufacturing and digitization of working um, offers huge opportunity. Um, You've got the, all of the data that comes from there. How, so how do you take the data and, yeah, from the workplace, from the, from the products, from the machines, from the individuals? Uh, how do you also protect people from data as well, which is a different question. So how do you protect premises? How do you protect services? And how do you protect user anonymity uh, within that space? The, uh, lots of opportunity and questions around data and how you use those services. Uh, then you've got sustainability and you know, the ever-growing need around creating more sustainable solutions uh, that you know, remove you know, unnecessary energy usage, uh, for example, or material consumption that isn't required. Um, you know, creating smaller form footprints so that you're using less materials or uh, less, um, less uh, producing less waste out of your efficient uh, out of your process as well, and also life cycle management. Uh, that goes into that so you make sure you're designing in from the start point of i know this is going to be available over the lifetime that i predict for the product uh, as well so sustainability key area and then there's the unknown the, the really exciting stuff is the stuff that we don't know about okay so i've talked about all the things we do know about 
what, what don't we know about that is going to come through and yeah part of the, part of the fun of all of this is being able to look for the new things that are going to disrupt and change the shape of our world yeah and i know we talked a little bit about earlier about um about how people would onboard in here I and mean, are you i guess you guys are, are starting to get a program figured out with Shelly as far as how would somebody, if they're interested in talking to you about uh, their company or an investment in their company, what's the process of that? Yeah, so directly today through Shelly, um, because yeah, we're working with Shelly on yeah, building out a funnel of opportunity for us. Um, yeah, and then as we move that forward, then what David will be looking at is how do we actually take those and yeah, which ones do we choose to bring forward into an investment round uh, versus what we're also doing is looking at how do we fund yeah, businesses, give them access to our suppliers, our customers, and our product range through different devices that we can open up and right. unlock. So that includes, yeah, do we offer yeah, um, yeah, support around yeah, use of product in return for future yeah, in inclusion in our product range uh, and, and margin offset there. So there's lots of different ways in which we can get involved. So um, maybe an analogy, right? So what would it be like if Paramount moved a division to Bryan College Station and told people that, hey, if you want to get in the movies or in production, in film, in acting, in lighting, in any of these things, if we want to help innovate that industry, we have Paramount Studios here in Bryan College Station and we can get you distributed worldwide, we can get you in the hands of the right people and all these things. I mean, is that is that a fair analogy? I, I, I think if you're, you're doing something that is an industrial product that you want to take out to market to uh, industrial customers of yeah, anybody who's involved in making a, a product or maintaining or servicing a product, then you should be talking to us. You should be, okay, yeah. and, and which is why you're here. So let's talk about Texas A&M for a second because um, um, before all of this, you were already sponsoring um, students, like internships at Texas A&M in the ID department, yeah. um, and then those students got to go to your leadership conference in Malta, 250 people, and what was it, five uh, Aggie students? Uh, uh, yep, so well, they four, got to, I think. Four Aggie said, yeah. students that got to be there and present when they, they absolutely... Oh, um, yeah. They, tell, they, tell, tell them about uh, that. Yeah, they, they smashed it. So, yeah, we, we have a long-standing partnership with the industrial distribution uh, part, uh, team unit and uh, particularly the TIPS uh, talent incubation program. Um, so this year, for example, Jim and myself have been working together with uh, four students who've been working on two projects that we've set them, one around yeah, the biotech corridor here and one around yeah, video content and how do we develop yeah, our play around video. Um, super super high caliber people um, uh, so we were delighted to be able to bring them out to our leadership event uh, and they also came to our investor conference our capital markets day previous to that they, they spoke uh, around their experience that yeah what they'd gained from uh, both their journey with A&M which was profound and then how they you know uh, how they applied that to the work that they've done with ourselves and how they saw RS group yeah, working with Jim and the team in the Americas. Yeah, what's that? That's been like. Um, yeah, you couldn't pull two hundred and fifty senior leaders away from them afterwards. The, yeah, they just consumed. They were the, the center of attention in that room um, and, and beyond. So yeah, we, I think we're working with a few now uh, to yeah, a few of the guys to place them within our business. The, yeah, they've expressed an interest in working with us. We're clearly wanting to make sure that they stay with us. Um, but yeah, the talent that comes through and the ability, their ability to talk knowledgeably about our business, having just worked with us for what six to nine months on a yeah two day a week basis, yeah, so so impressive. Yeah, so it's a it's a two way street, right? So you've got um, at least from this novice watching this unfold, um, you've got the ability of RS Group to then get on campus over there and, and sponsor events, sponsored uh, Invent for the Planet, right? Yep. We just did here um, and had the finals here in this room uh, with the engineering department, but sponsor things, get their products and yeah, get the, the students at Texas A&M knowledgeable about what this company does. So when they go out into the workforce, they're gonna be knowledgeable of Design Spark and all these things. The other side of that is these guys get talents. So now 250 leaders of this company who assembled, met all these Aggies, they're going back all over the world and going, hey, are you hiring somebody? Have you called Texas A&M, right? Have you got an ID student or an engineering student or an MIS student or whatever out of A&M? So it's an amazing two-way street um, that this facility and their involvement here 
can start providing our community. I hope I'm stating that. That's, not that's, not, that's not that's overstating that. Absolutely right? true. Okay. Um, very cool. So what else, um, before we open up for questions, what else do you want us to know, want them to know about uh, what you're doing and, and, and how they can get involved? Well, I'm going to go back to Design Spark, by the way, uh, because, yeah, I'm very proud to have been part of Design Spark ever since its conception. Um, we are now on a program around sustainable design engineering. So how do we make, uh, help engineers make smart choices around the products that they, they select, the way that they design, um, and the solutions that they work, work with in the future? So we've got a program of activity that I'd encourage everybody to go and look at Design Spark at and then think about how that plays into the world that you're working with. So there are things that I'm already aware of, like yeah, the work that David's doing with Hypercool, um, I think yeah, it's such a great fit. What Stephanie's doing with Skypaws is again a, a play around how do you make things that are going to make a meaningful difference uh, in, in in people's outcomes or in yeah, in Stephanie's case in animals' outcomes as well. So I yeah, we we'd encourage people to look at yeah sustainability and the the programs that we're running there. Uh, and just think about how they can you can make a difference and connect with other engineers because the whole purpose of Design Spark is to get people to talking with each other, collaborating and sharing. Uh, and that again, come back to the spirit of this place. This is what this is about. It's about collaboration. It's about sharing, and it's about inspiration that can come from there. And I think the more that we've got people talking to each other, and particularly, I love being able to do this face to face after two years of yeah not knowing who you can talk to safely. Um, yeah, the more you get people talking to each other, then yeah, generally the better the outcome is because you're getting more experience in and more insight from different sources. Uh, and that is really what I, we want to achieve here. Yeah, get people in here, make this a destination venue and get people collaborating and talking. So a ton of cooperation, right? Absolutely. A ton of coordination. Um, so a quick um, organization chart really to kind of outline this out. So. Um, Lake Walk, of course, is our commercial area here with Fujifilm Dyson Biotechnologies and Viasat and Estella. The Design Spark Innovation Center is part of Lake Walk. The POV Coffee Shop, all the, this is all Lake Walk, right? The Design Spark Innovation Center is actually in our public private partnership with the city of Bryan. So it's set up as an economic development tool uh, for this region. And so um, we, we showed up here in the P3 with Bryan to do this very thing to gin this up and to get these types of activities going, um, then we were approached by Design Spark RS group about, hey, what are you guys doing here? How can we help? That led to a naming rights uh, conversation. And so Design Spark actually put their name on the building, just like American Airlines put their name on the American Airlines you know, Center in Dallas or Toyota Center in, in Houston, right? So it's the Design Spark Innovation Center, but it's not owned by Design Spark. It's still owned in our public-private partnership with the city of Bryan. Uh, Design Spark is not the only member in the Design Spark Innovation Center. They have a good chunk of it, and they're going to have the only maker space here. Um, but there's going to be other act. There already are other activities. Caleb's here with Axelbox, Cap Fleet guys. We've got some family offices on the investment side, and so we're going to be ramping up our corporate membership uh, here as well. And those corporations or companies that want to have a presence, they want to be able to come into the building meet with people, look for research, look for startups, look for things to invest in alongside these people. But Design Spark's gonna get the first shot at these things to get funneled through um, because of our relationship and what we've set up. Uh, and so it's a unique kind of, um, it's almost a P3 in and of itself. We've seen a lot of different incubator accelerator types of ideas. We haven't seen one exactly like this. Doesn't mean it's any better, it just means it's different. We're trying to customize it for our unique situation here. A lot of the companies that we're going to be inviting in are companies that have office presence in Houston, Austin, Dallas, San Antonio, but they don't have an office here um, because they can get here in you know an hour and a half, right? And so they drive home a lot. Well, when they drive here, we want them to come in, spend the night at the Stella, be a member here, be able to work out, work with these people, go on campus, and this will be their home away from home. Uh, when they're here versus a Starbucks or something like that. Nothing wrong with Starbucks or POV or anything else, but we think this is a pretty cool place for people to hang out and have these collisions, these intersections, these, um, these, these uh, casual conversations that lead to things like Raspberry Pi, for example. Right? Um, so that's the, a little bit of the housekeeping as far as who's doing what uh, here. Um, so super happy to have you here, Mike. Thank you Delighted very much. Um, he's still working on jet lag. Uh, but uh, 
let's just open it up. Let's open it up to any questions. Yes, ma'am. What uh, focus do you see, if any, on disability, either in new products needed for the disability community or the products being designed having a disability focus or needing a disability focus? Great question. Um, so when it comes to accessibility, so we are looking at how do we develop our ESG solutions, as we're calling it. So we've just um, made a couple of announcements around yeah, strengthening that area. And certainly, yeah, social mobility and social access, including yeah, how do you support people with you uh, dis dis disabled or differently abled. Um, that's one of the things that we've been looking at. Now, in the UK, one of the programs that we've got in flight at the moment is with a, co a um, charity called uh, Dream Chairs. Um, they're working on how do you create disabled access for disabled people using uh, a, a new variety of wheelchairs to be able to create more automation within that chair uh, and re respond to specific user characteristics that are going to be required as people have different mobility challenges uh, as well. So yeah, we are working with some of the partnerships that are involved around yeah, product supply and product support in that first instance and then yeah, link, linking them together with design agencies who can help test and iterate those um, those chairs into a final finished bill of material and then beyond into mass mass production. That's only in the UK though, nothing going on yeah, here. It's a, private, uh, it's a private enterprise at the moment in the UK and then what we'll be doing is looking at how do you scale that uh, if successful and we'll also be looking at different partnerships in the US and beyond. What we'll be doing with our ESG agenda is formalising the plans for different geographies over the course of the next few months uh, and then we'll be looking at how do we get the input of ideas and opportunities to be able to create the new uh, solutions that are going to be required. <coughs> Fantastic. Who else? Caleb. Uh, I have a genuine question that I don't know the answer to so I was hoping you could answer it for me. So I have a deep passion for public safety and defence technologies. I primarily play in that space. I do have seven manufacturing companies that we're standing up right now in this community. Through your large organization um, of distribution, is there a way to identify source of origin labeling or source of country as to where these parts are coming from? Um, that's a meaningful way for me to use non-Asian parts um, for the demands that we're getting in the U.S. government purchasing going forward? Is that yeah, something that's possible? Yeah, it's a great question. And uh, it's also one of the biggest questions we get asked uh, quite a lot around, uh, by customers at the moment for obvious reasons. Um, so we, we take in loads of information when we bring products into our product range, including is what is declared by the manufacturers, their country of origin, so the country of manufacture. So that information is held within our information uh, systems, so we can make that available to users. I'm not sure if it is displayed publicly on the web, uh, but we can. Yeah, we have the ability within our back office systems to be able to make that uh, available to users at, on request and be able to check country of origin with supply chain and say, actually, this is uh, this is what is declared by the manufacturer. So yeah, these are the parts to avoid if you want to exclude particular countries from there. What I would say, just being completely open, is that that is by you know, what is declared by the manufacturer. Yeah, sometimes, you can stop the recording at this point, David. Um, sometimes what is declared is not necessarily what is yeah, actually on the product itself. So there is a further level of batch traceability that yeah, then flows through from there. So yeah, one of the things that we're doing, I think we can do this in the uh, Fort Worth warehouse, and I'm looking again for information here, is that we've got lock code and date code uh, information as well that then adds a net, another layer of uh, security to say you've not just got country of origin, you can then trace that back to the specific manufactured lot and therefore that is your second layer of security around yeah, the information being correct. Yeah. Well, very excited to have you here. I have tons to talk about. But, uh, we'll Over a beer. Yeah. Real quick, Kate, is she waiting on mic for... But we're good, okay? okay. Dr. Page. A question, just one other. Um, I'm with the uh, Fujifilm Dyson across the street from the, the head engineer over there. But I had a question since you're in Tesla, right? So the Elon Musk companies are one of your customers. Yeah, we're not buying Twitter, but okay, just, <laughs> just to be clear. Yeah, we're not going to talk about Twitter. Um, so when you have customers that are looking for solutions to you, 
you don't have, right? Or you're looking for yeah. solutions to. So it's that part of that feedback loop into the system too, which is to say, hey, makers or people in the network out there, yeah. can you come up with something that meets these constraints yeah. or these, you know? Our two biggest sources of information are customer demand and supply demand. Those that we sit between those two. So customers telling us what they're looking for that we don't have, and suppliers telling us what they're looking for but you know, they currently can't find. Those are the two points of uh, congruence that we've got to actually bring that together. So future cust yeah, customer demand and being able to sense where future trends are going. Yeah, yeah. We were talking about this phrase earlier today about yeah, skating to where the puck is going, yeah. not where the, where it currently is. It's a yeah. hockey yeah. phrase. Yeah. 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 Clearly, 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 being a Brit, I know my ice hockey. Yeah. Um, so the members are the yeah. The so the the community, the, the university, the, the members there's in a, here. There's a need for these twenty solutions given this. Yeah. These are opportunities for you to innovate in. Like these are targets. Yes. For you to go out yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Hence, hence yeah. this space in yeah. this environment with a billion dollars of research a year yeah. surrounding it. And hence got, also the work. You've got Neuralink, you've got SpaceX, you've got yeah. Tesla, yeah. you've got the Boring Company, you've got, you know, that's a lot of hardware. Yeah. Uh, and hence the, the work that we did with um, the TIP students this year on yeah. understanding more around the specific opportunity within the biotech corridor. Because yet yeah, again, the, it's where industry is going. Where where is the opportunity going to present itself next to us? And understanding that. And that was a CEO of Texas Biotech CEOs conference uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I talked to this really lovely lady from Houston who had had cancer, and she came with this whole cryotherapy thing, yeah. and she had to get her um, prototypes made in Canada, for instance. Yes. Yeah. Down in Houston Medical Center. Clearly there, yeah, there is there is plenty of opportunity. Yeah, what we've got to figure out is how do we serve that opportunity in a way that's yeah profitable to both of us. Who's next, Mr. Belden? When it comes to developing and testing different prototypes for what I'm sure is you know, dozens of different businesses, dozens of different products, I, I imagine the space needs required to develop and test those products can vary. From one end of the spectrum to the other, do you just have to outsource that to a specific location? Based uh, on the product. Yeah. So it, it, we will play in a certain certain space. So we're at the early stage of prototyping, where we we um, will look at how do you support product development through to a point where you've got an iteration uh, that you the user is comfortable with for yeah what we'd call very early stage prototyping. I think beyond that, it needs to go to specialist because you know, you're going to be looking at specific demands, testing environments that are going to be required, uh, legislative standards that will be involved on in there. So what we tend to do is look at partners that we can then work with that that can be outsourced to, or um, that we can make introductions to for users to go on and find the right uh, solution for them. Yeah, I think we have, let's not pretend we can manage all of that in house because we absolutely can't. Yeah. People like places to get CE marks, yeah. See, see, so. yeah, UL and CE marking is a classic example of yeah, where that, that's a layer beyond the capability that we would ever offer, Chris. Um, so, Design Spark trying to connect engineers to engineers to get the competition going to keep the sales team paid. How does that, does that, does that off their backs, if you will? I, I get that, but. Um, where does the like the specifier come into play? Because if because you, you're the the ID side, I mean they're they're creating yeah. windows or mullions or component stuff, right? But then when all those components come together, uh, uh, and somebody's got to specify that, how, how do you get the specifiers in there to to push the products further down? Yeah. The bill of material. So how do how do you how do you influence where that bill of material ends up? So th th we've got a number of routes to be able to try and achieve that. Um, predominantly what we're trying to do with Design Spark and how that links then to the core business is, if you talk to the design engineer, they're making choices about which part goes onto the bill of material. 
we've then got different plays into the, the purchaser and the specifier through our existing capabilities that we've got, for example, through the Ally business or through the RS business in the UK, where yeah, that's where our sales specialist teams will talk to the purchaser or to talk to the inventory teams around how do you manage that supply. Rule of thumb for us is that the more contacts that we talk to from different uh, parts of the business within an organisation, the more value that we get from that business and the more value they see from us because we're supporting them across our design, their design needs, their bulk, man bulk purchasing needs and their maintenance and the procure emergency procurement needs as well. So the challenge for us is how do we expand our reach <coughs> within each business to be able to cover all sides of the equation. And that's where it comes into the new and the different in that yeah, more and more, it's not just those guys anymore that are stakeholders. You've got your um, inf infosec people, the uh, cyber security uh, guys. You've got uh, technology specialists that need to be engaged with as well. So yeah, the, the opportunity to expand contacts ex yeah, grows exponentially as businesses get more complex as well. I think we have time for one more, if anybody has a question. Um, or we can head out to uh, beer and dinner. Okay, well, we'll let Shelly wrap up. Um, all right, well, hey, Mike, appreciate it very much. Thanks for being here. Thank you very much.